All right, so now let me go to, uh, I'm gonna, I downloaded this as a PowerPoint. I'm gonna just do a whole screen share though. Where is screen share? Actually, we'll do this, just do that. All right, so if you download the, the first set of slides that says uh, read, this is what, if you download it as a PowerPoint, it looks like this. All right, so let me go through this. And a lot of what you guys said is very, you guys were spot on. I really thought that was really nice. All right, so come on. Come on, computer. There we go. I need to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Okay. All right, so this is a good scientific def, uh, definition. So a, a body of information and an approach to problems based on observation and experiments. So science is both a set of information and a method. So it's not just, you know, here's the info, but how did we get the info? And, and, and when we say it's based on observation and experiment, a couple of people said that. Observation means it's something measurable and experiments means it's testable. And it's important to realize that there's a lot of very interesting questions that are really important and heavily discussed that we just can't deal with them scientifically because if we can't measure it and we can't test it, that means we can't deal with it scientifically. It doesn't mean it's not interesting. I see a hand, yes. Uh, Li Ping, I saw your hand go up. No, okay. So, you know, for example, uh, religious questions, very obviously very interesting. You can't necessarily measure and test a lot of that stuff. And so that doesn't mean, it, again, just because it's scientific doesn't mean it's not interesting and doesn't mean it's not important. It just means it can't be dealt with that way. And there have been a lot of things that say 50 years ago, we couldn't deal with scientifically. And now we can because we found ways to measure and test them. All right, so let me go through. So these are the, the, the steps that we typically talk about in the scientific method. And I'm gonna go through each one separately. And again, these slides are available. Observation, question, a hypothesis, controlled experiments, and then a theory. All right, and I'll, I'll just kind of run a couple of threads through here, a couple of examples as well. All right, so an observation, usually if I say, what do we mean by observation? Most people will say something I see. But, you know, you can hear something. You can hear something crackle, or you can hear a pop or a boom, right? Uh, you can feel something, or, or I'm sorry, touch something. See here, touch, taste, or feel, right? You can touch something. So you can uh, be mixing two chemicals together and you notice it gets warm. Or uh, you can take, tasting isn't a good idea. In, uh, you know what, I, I don't have, I don't have smell on here. Now that I look at this, smell, oh, smell should be on there. A touch and feel are kind of the same thing. So smell should be on there, odor. But sometimes, you know, you'll, there'll be an odor. Well, what is that smell? That's an observation. Uh, but tasting is not a good idea in chemistry, but tasting, you know, how do we know something? How do they know something tasted sweet? Now, in science, if you were to walk into um, a lab, especially a modern, you know, nowadays, you know, using test tubes and beakers and flasks, it's still done, but a lot more stuff is done using instrumentation. And what you'd probably see is a computer attached to a box, and that box has a bunch of tubes and little metal sticks coming out of it. All those do is they expand our senses. So for example, you have the examples I have, microscopes, thermometers, right? You can, you can hold something in your hand and you can go, oh, that's hot. And you can even hold two things. You can go, this is warmer than this, but you can't say how much warmer, right? You can't say, oh, this is five, and you can't say what the temperature is. A thermometer can do that for you. Microscopes to see things that are really small or telescopes to see things that are really far away. Right? So all they do is expand our senses. We do a lot of things with measuring electric current because things can change current and they can make very, very small changes that you couldn't even, there's no way you could feel it, but an instrument can sense you know, a five millivolt difference or something like that. So all we do is we have fancy machines to help us with something else. I see a hand up, yeah. Li Ping? I'm sorry, I think it's the old hand. Oh, okay, it's the old hand. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, a couple of examples I'm gonna run through here. Um, 
Isaac Newton, right, to start with an observation. Isaac Newton, um, the old story is apple fell, hit him on the head, and that's where gravity came from. And so, but the observation is the apple fell down. Um, a scientist named Constantine Falberg uh, noticed a sweet taste on his hand one evening. And, you know, really not the best lab practice because the person didn't wash, he didn't wash his hands after he left work. And uh, again, the observation is this tastes sweet and the hands shouldn't have tasted sweet at that point. I think he actually was having a cigarette or something. Okay, this is how saccharin was discovered, right? So those are just, and again, observate, you can have an observation and just stop there, right? I heard a noise, my dog barked. That's an observation, right now. Observation is the first step in the scientific method, but I would argue that it's not the first scientific step because people make observations all the time. Where it becomes scientific is when you start asking a question and you say, well, apples have been falling off the trees way before Isaac Newton saw one, but Newton said, why did the apple fall down, right? Falbert with the, with the sweet, right? Why is this sweet? It shouldn't be sweet. So once you ask the question, now it's, now it's a scientific inquiry. All right, now, this is, uh, I mentioned just at the very beginning of class that we, there's a lot of words, this, the vocabulary of science, words can have different meanings in different contexts. And uh, whatever, you know, each of you have your own fields that you're either involved in now or that you're going into it, every field has its own vocabulary. And what a word means to me and what a word means to someone else may be very, very different. My youngest daughter is in a PhD program in gender studies and native studies. And some of the words, I have to look up words when I talk to her, right? Um, but we're gonna see this several times and this is gonna be the first example. So we have the, the word, in science we have the word hypothesis. And a hypothesis is not the same as a theory. And yet people, the general population uses the word theory, but in, in science, the word theory is very, very different. A lot of times when people say my theory is, it's actually a hypothesis. And I'll explain that right now. So a hypothesis is, uh, whoops, it's an educated guess to answer the question. So when we say it's an educated guess, remember I said science is a body of information. So as long as scientific data has been gathered, right, that's just added to the body of scientific knowledge. So we base things on what we already knew. So for example, so it's a, and it's a guess to answer the question, but it's not a random guess. So for example, why did the apple fall down? Well, we know, right, Newton knew everything falls down. Way before Newton, right, human beings saw things fall and everything falls, nothing falls up, everything falls down. So what are some hypotheses? A guess to explain it. Maybe something is pulling it down or maybe something is pushing it down, right? And the reason I add the pushing, I mean, most people know gravity is a pull, but pushing might have been a reasonable guess then back in those days, right? You know something's causing it to do it. Maybe something's pushing it down, right? Uh, the fall birthday, thing, my hands are sweet. Why are my hands sweet? Well, I know I didn't wash my hands. So I'm gonna guess that maybe something from the lab is on my hands, okay? Again, it's based on things you know. It's not just some random thing. You know, and then the, you might, might ask another question. Well, what did I work with? All right, now, once we ask the question, once we form our hypothesis, and it's really important, this is, this is very early, right? It's a guess. The word guess is really important. Once we form a hypothesis, we test it. So observation and experiment, right? So the test is called a controlled experiment. So without using the word controlled, if someone wants to throw out what that means, some of you might know. I mean, you, know, you probably saw this stuff you know, in high school, or junior high, they taught. This isn't new to college. Any idea what we mean by a controlled experiment? Making sure that nothing is contaminated and while you're uh, doing the experiment itself if it requires um, special material in other words and then making sure that everything in the area is clean and safe. The clean and safe is a very important piece. We don't necessarily need specialized equipment though uh, Nate, but, but you're on the right track. Nathan what were you going to say? 
I saw your hand up. No? Uh, I see, Georgia, you're, you're, the color you've chosen for your hand blends with the wall behind you. It's hard to see sometimes. Go ahead, though. Um, I was just gonna say, when you have a kind of power over what happens in the test, like how you conduct it. Okay, that's power part of it. You, you, want to, you want to test it in a very methodical way. I, I see Katarina and then Miguel and then Douglas. We need, and we need experimental and controlled group. Okay, what do you mean by, so when you say you control, you're using the word control. And that's right, we need experimental and control groups. What are you trying to achieve with that control group? We need to see if um, the result of what happened during an experiment was not caused by chance. Okay, that, that, that's what you're trying to deal with. Very good. Uh, Miguel, I see. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's something where uh, all of the variables in the experiment, I believe, I think that's the word for it, they all stay the same except for one. Yeah, that's pretty spot on. That Yeah, you guys are all hitting that. And then I got Douglas. I was just going to reiterate what Miguel said about um, in a controlled uh, situation, all of your variables are the same so that you experiment in the same way. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go on and you guys hit it right on spot on. So basically it means we test one variable at a time, right? So by the way, I think if you watch this, these slides, like you see how when I hit a click another, you know, that little animation, so to speak, I don't think those work if you watch it directly in Canvas, the slides will disappear with everything there, or if you download it first, that's what you'll lose. Yeah, so the idea is that you test one variable at a time, which means that you've got to do the experiment in a very methodical way. You want things, you don't want contamination, someone, I forget who said that, but if you have contamination, that's a variable, right? So you don't want to introduce any new variables. And that means that if something changes, it's only the variable that you're testing. So that means if there's five variables, you got to test five things separately and keep the other four the same. It's very, very hard to do uh, when you're doing tests um, with a population of human beings. So a lot of the stuff they've done with, with and we'll talk about um, drug testing towards the end of the semester, but when they do, when, when um, a drug company does clinical trials, there is a huge variation in the human population. Even if you're doing, you know, some countries have more homogeneous populations than others. But even if you're in a relatively homogeneous population, there's still a huge amount of individual variation. And so the way you kind of get around that is you do large numbers so that the individual variations tend to cancel out. But I, I think one thing too, when you when, we'll talk about this much later, but I. I, I don't think most people have an appreciation for the complexity of a human being as a biological entity. Just your body is a very, very complex system. And so, you know, that's why, you know, one person gets a side effect and one person gets a disease and might die from it. And someone else gets a disease and doesn't even know they have it. One person you give a drug to and they have a really weird reaction and one person it does exactly what it says, right? And we'll talk about that kind of stuff in more detail much later in the semester. But that's why you, the idea in controlled experiments is you test one variable at a time. And the reason is you want to say, this happened because of this, not something else. Right. So let's say if we were we we're doing a, what, what the, the sweet, the sweet one, Fallbrook's thing, if you're working with three compounds that day, I'll just go ahead and do this and, and instead of put it out as a thought question. If you're working with three compounds that day, what you might want to do is you'd have to test each thing separately. Right. You would test A is A sweet, is B sweet, is C sweet then maybe combinations. What about if I mix A and B, or mix A and C, or mix B and C, or mix A, B and C, right? Now, when I used to tell the story, I could have, I didn't look it up again, but I think he was a cigarette. I think he actually went out and you know, got home and had a cigarette, and that was what tasted sweet. So you might even do something as simple as, well, take another cigarette out and see if it had nothing to do with it. Maybe it was something on the pack from the morning. You know, it could have been anything else. So it's not always obvious. When I was at uh, my research in graduate school, 
I was doing work on um, interactions of, of different types of, of cells within the immune system. And we had a, a pretty controlled system. And what we did is we added various components of cell membranes to um, basically a surface. And then we would see if cells would react with them and if we could stimulate an immune response just by making basically making a fake cell. And then what we started doing is, well, let's add this and see what that does. Let's add this. And I added this one thing and it completely knocked out the immune response, like down to zero. And I was like, oh my God, that's a big deal. And then when I started doing control tests, you know what I found out? When I added that chemical, it took everything else off of the surface. So it was basically nothing. So I had nothing in the test tube, but I didn't know that until I did those other tests. But that's an example. Sometimes there's a variable that you don't think of. That's why, so that's one of the reasons that science changes. All right, so let's go on. Uh, yeah, that's what I said. And then combinations. I haven't looked at these slides in a while. <laughs> Go through them earlier today, though. One. All right. Now, controlled experiments can do two things. They can tell you that you're you guessed wrong. The hypothesis is a guess. So if you guess wrong, well, it was a guess, right? I mean, it was a, maybe a smart guess, but smart guesses can be wrong, and it does happen frequently. We don't usually hear about it. That's one of the things that's really unfortunate about the internet era because someone can do an experiment and put it up on the internet and it hasn't been peer reviewed yet and it gets out there and they haven't had a chance to really look at it and say, you know, and, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, but what do we do realistically? If we find out that our hypothesis is wrong, we make a new hypothesis. I guessed wrong, right? So I guess I'm gonna guess again. Uh, another example, this happened to me yesterday. So my mother is, my mother is 84 and she is a little technologically challenged. And so she was having trouble with her voice activated remote. And so I got over to her house and I'm playing with it. And I tried talking to it. And I tried, you know, maybe didn't like that channel or didn't understand the words. I ended, and I tried, literally, I tried doing it through her cable, you know, through her, her interface. And I tried it a different way. I tried a different, uh, turned out, you know what was wrong? The batteries were dead. But that was like, I kept testing different things, right? I tested this, that was wrong. I tested this, that was wrong. So I'm sure all of you have done something where something isn't working and you try to, you're trying to troubleshoot it and you try A and that doesn't work and you try B. That's really the scientific method. Now. If it confirms our hypothesis, then it's called a theory. And a theory is very different than a hypothesis. The main difference, okay, well, you'll see when I click again, it's an explanation confirmed by controlled experiments. So if you compare it to a hypothesis, the difference is the controlled experiments. Oops, yeah, okay, so they're both, whoops, see, they're both explanations. But the big difference is a hypothesis is not tested. It's before you tested it. It's like, I think this is what's happening. And it might be right and it might be wrong. But a theory has been tested. But we all know, and, and again, I'm not faulting when I say this. I don't want anyone to get the impression that I'm not one of those people that I think everybody's, everyone's a bunch of idiots if they're not a scientist. That's not, nothing could be further from the truth. It's just different words and different vocabularies. So when you talk, you know, people who aren't scientists, they'll say, well, my theory is this. And you're using the word theory the, with the meaning in the general population. And, and, but what you're really talking about is a hypothesis. And what happens is the scientific community says, oh, it's a theory. This is our theory. And people, everybody else goes, oh, it's a theory. It's a guess. They don't know it's a theory. Right, but really, in the scientific community, a theory is a much bigger deal. We just use the same word, and that that whole idea that different, you know, the same words in different contexts have caused a lot of, I would argue, a lot of major misunderstandings have happened. I've had discussions with people over a, you know, just you know, over coffee or over a couple of beers over some theories, and the, well, well, that's just a theory. Why should I listen to it? And I explain, well, it's a scientific theory, which means it's got a lot of data that says it's true and you know, but there are no absolutes and I'll get to that in a second. Yes, go ahead. Um, I guess that if, if you prove a theory, does it stay a theory? 
It's called a theory when it's proven, yes. Yeah. And that's because there's no, there's, science really doesn't deal in absolutes. Um, yeah, that's the next slide. Everything, so to speak, is a theory. Now, sometimes there are theories that have been around for a really, really long time. And so we might call it a law, like a scientific law. Laws in general, there might be a, a theory could be broad, like the theory of gravitation versus the law of you know, um, Newton's law of universal gravitation is different than gravitational theory. Newton's law of universal gravitation is, a, is an equation versus the theory, which is broader. But we do have scientific laws, but a law is really a theory that's been around a long time. And, and it's, it tends to be universally accepted. But theories can still be proven wrong. And a, a good example, I have the x-rays example. So x-rays, um, the laws of physics had been discussed for years and years and years, you know, way, way back, you know, the ancient Greeks and, you know, Newton was in the 1600s and they understood a lot of stuff about, uh, about various things. X-rays were discovered in the 1800s. Once x-rays were discovered, the physics community, a lot of people said, oh my goodness, we didn't even know x-rays were there. That, those could have actually explained what we thought was going on. And so it really caused a revolution in science where a lot of the, you know, it, the scientific community in that field had to go back and recheck a lot of stuff and say, well, wait, did x, were there x-rays there? It's a variable that no one knew about, right? And so things can change. I'll give you another example. Um, I don't know if I do, well, if, I'll do it now, and if I talk about it later, it's redundant. Um, actually, I'll talk about it later, because it'll come up later, all right? But there are scientific theories that have been around for a couple hundred years, and then new information came out. But we pretty much go with it until we're proven wrong. And uh, it only takes a couple experiments to prove something wrong. So yes, that, that was a good question. Is it still called a theory? Evolution is evolutionary theory. That's a good example. It doesn't mean, you know, an evolutionary theory has a huge amount of data and it's universally accepted by the scientific community. And actually, we won't, that's not something we talk about in this class, but there's like one major misconception in the general populations and the general population's understanding of evolutionary theory. People will say, well, if we evolve, if we evolve from frogs, why are there still frogs? which if evolution was linear would make sense, but evolution isn't linear, it's branched. So it's better to say we didn't evolve from frogs. Humans and frogs have common ancestor. Humans and monkeys have a common ancestor. We didn't evolve from them. We evolved, you know, we set, it, it went different. So it's kind of an interesting conversation. All right. Uh, these are just some examples of, of some controversy, right? So climate change, anthropogenic means it's from humans you know, that climate change is caused by humans. And there are a lot of people who don't, there are people who don't believe that. But it's a, climate change is a theory. It's based on what's called a global climate model. Huge amount of data. We're gonna do a whole unit on this. And, it, and, and the other thing like climate, climate is extremely complex. We'll talk later about um, the difference between weather and climate, right? Uh, evolutionary theory I mentioned. Any other questions about scientific method? Those are really good questions. What about axioms? Axioms? An axiom is kind of like a law. Usually they're just kind of a small, like, like an equation type of thing, or they're kind of a, a, an offshoot of a law. So here's the general idea, and then there's this little side theory or side idea. It's the same idea though. In science, if it's a, an axiom would be like a theory. Is it the same? Does it follow? Does math follow the same rules? Is it like there are theorems and proofs and stuff? Is it basically the same idea? Well, you know, math. I would argue. You know, I'm going to get in trouble with the math department. <laughs> math isn't really. It's more. It's it, it's not really a science. It's more internally consistent because math was developed to explain science. So, um, but it kind of follows the same thing because you can prove mathematically. You know, because when you do, if, if you've taken enough math where you've done proofs, that's exactly what you're doing. You're proving that, you know, two plus two equals four using, a, using mathematical information, the, the old math data. 
right, how are we doing on time? We just have it on the screen. Oh, we do. We got 15 minutes. Yet. All right. Let me go ahead and push forward here. So that's science in general. Since this is a chemistry class, whoops, what did I just do? Oh, wait a minute. Ah. Um, let's talk about what chemistry is. Let me see. I'm going to make sure. Where, where, what am I doing here? I'll just do it this way. Oh, chemistry, that's the last slide. All right. Chemistry is the study of matter and its interactions. And the next set of slides is going to talk about matter. And, and just uh, uh, the general approach to this class is we're going to talk about a lot of just basic chemistry stuff, and then we'll start applying it. We'll, so we, if, as we have enough, enough chemistry information to apply it, we will. But it, just at the beginning of the class, we're going to do a lot of chemistry, and then we'll start applying it to society. So you, before you understand, before you understand how climate, you know, uh, climate change stuff and global warming, you have to understand what fossil fuel, what hydrocarbons are and what happens when you burn them and what that means, right? And you have to understand how um, the sun's energy interacts with molecules, at least a little bit. Obviously, you know, you're not gonna be writing a doctoral dissertation on this right now, so we're not going to that depth. But the last slide in this set is what is chemistry? And you know, the three major sciences, chemistry, physics, and biology. Physics is the study of energy, and we'll talk a lot about energy. Uh, I just found some really cool stuff in the paper about energy uh, recently that I'm going to use in this class. Um, biology, of course, anything biologically, uh, anything that's living or relevant to living things. Uh, chemistry is the study of matter and its interactions. And so how do we, we're defining a term in terms of another term or defining chemistry in terms of matter. So a good definition for matter, and it's such a fundamental concept that it's almost hard to define. But you can define matter as anything that takes up space, anything that has a volume. And it doesn't have to have a lot of volume. It can take up very little space. A proton takes up very small amount of space, but it is matter. If you want a very a, a real simplification, you can just say matter is stuff. And there's only two things in the universe. There's matter and empty space, which means there's stuff, and there's the space between the stuff. This is really oversimplified, but it is true. <laughs> now it's, it's true. There's stuff. There's only the stuff, and there's the space between the stuff, and that's it. Uh, it's kind of oversimplified. But we'll spend a lot of time on um, on what chemistry is and, and more detail about matter. All right, let me get out of the screen share for a second and we'll look at something else. So I want to do, I might spend 10 minutes on the next set of slides, but let's, let me do this. At this point, I was going to do the whole screen. If you look at this, there's the, you could actually do this first reading assignment down here if you want to. I have it. I have it set to be due on the seventh, which is Monday. Um, and basically, what this is, is, I cut this article out of the paper the other day. Let's see if it comes up fast. I saw this actually last semester when I was on sabbatical. But this is really this was in the UT. The San Diego paper has gotten a lot better in recent years. And they, they have, there's good stuff in there. And this was um, basically mixed messaging. And this is kind of an, an interesting look at how you know, the general population sees, you know, the message keeps changing, but how in science, it just basically, you know, that's how we do things. And there's three good examples about the coronavirus, right? And you can read through this and then there's just a few questions to answer. And then you can uh, upload this as well in the space below. So that's due next week. Go back to here. It would upload right uh, now. Where is it? Right there. Okay. And you won't be able to do homework one until we finish the next set of slides. So let me just be in the interest of me being consistent with what I'd said about trying to take advantage of all the time. We're technically done at 2.10. So let me spend the next few minutes. I'm gonna at least start the next set of slides. So these are the slides. Right, anytime it says read, that means it's a set, it's a PowerPoint. Again, the videos, these are me lecturing over them a year ago. 
So it's kind of the same thing as now, except now it's live. So it's not going to be exactly the same. Yeah. Nathan. Um, Professor, I heard you said at the beginning of class that you were going to take role also. I was just making sure you hadn't taken role yet. Uh, uh, Zoom takes role for me automatically. Perfect. Thank you. I, I can get a report that says who was logged in. You know, I, I didn't say this, though. If you're using a name on Zoom that's different than the name I have you registered as, I don't care if you do that, but you might want to send me a little note saying, yeah, well, my name is, I'm using John, but my name is really Phil. Okay, you know, just so I know I can give you credit for being here. Uh, again, I'm not going to, I'm usually I'm doing it mostly for participation, you know, uh, things like that. But yeah, it, it, Zoom does that. All right, let me just go through the, at least a couple of these slides and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop in about 10 minutes. So this is what matter is, as I said. That, so the nature of matter, that's what chemistry does. So there's actually a theory um, that I'm gonna go into, which is the next slide. So matter, as I said, anything that has mass and occupies space. Saying that matter is anything that has mass is correct, but it's a little bit circular because um, Mass is defined as the amount of matter. So if you say, well, what's matter? It's anything with mass. Well, what's mass? It's the amount of matter. It doesn't really help, right? Um, but that's why if you say it occupies space, that's good. Matter is made of little tiny, tiny pieces. It's really best that we do it this way. Um, so this is what's called kinetic molecular theory. It, there's a lot of data that says it's true. And this is actually used mostly to discuss uh, gases, but we're gonna I expand it to discuss uh, all matter. So, uh, and this came out a long time ago, all matter is made of tiny particles. Okay, so even the air in this room is made of little tiny particles. Um, this piece of paper is made of little tiny particles. Uh, something solid like my phone is made of little tiny particles. Uh, the liquid, the water in my cup, made of little tiny particles, all right? All those particles are in con, oh, this is where it would be so much better to be in class, anyway. Uh, all those particles are in constant motion, all right? And what, what people don't understand is there's actually three types of motion. There's what's called vibration, rotation, and translation. So vibrational motion is just what it sounds like. It's just kind of vibrating, shaking. I don't know how we can see it better, all right? Rotation is spinning on an axis. Translational motion is if an object moves past another object, changes its position in space. To be moving, you only have to have one type of motion. All right, and then uh, the other part is particles move in straight lines until they collide. Uh, I threw the thing about temperature in here um, because temperature is actually related to particle speed. So as the temperature increases, particles move faster. Uh, and then the other part, I didn't put it in here. Particles will move in straight lines until they collide. When they collide, they bounce off. Now, that, there, there's more detail because they, don't, uh, you know, they can stick a little bit as well. But for the purposes of this theory, we can explain a lot by saying that they bounce off. So you think of it as like little tiny marbles that they just move and they hit and they bounce. Yes, sir. Um, now, they, they move in a straight line. Does gravity affect them? Gravity can affect them, yes. Yeah. All right, so let me do a little bit. Called, Go ahead. I thought I heard something. Was it called uh, Brownian motion? Well, Brownian motion is just, it's just when you kind of see things are just kind of zipping around like this. Yeah, that's Brownian motion. Yeah, and you have to remember, they might be colliding with things that you don't see. Now, you know, and again, gravity can affect that, that as well. Gravity can, because then you have a force pulling on something. And that's, that's an energy consideration. So kinetic molecular theory doesn't necessarily take into account um, the energy that, that goes into it as well. It does a little bit with the temperature thing. This is really used to discuss some other aspects of it. That's why but what you guys are hitting on is theories aren't necess don't, don't necessarily talk about all aspects of something. It depends on what the theory is being used for. All right, so let's just go a little ways into this. Um, just as an example, if, uh, if we talk about now, everyone walking in the door, you guys know what a solid liquid and a gas are, right? We know that this pen 
is a solid, right? And we know that the water, you can't see it, but the water in this cup is a liquid and the air in this room is a gas. Um, what people don't necessarily think about is if you were gonna describe, not in, in the particulate, not in terms of the particles, but if you were gonna describe a solid, so someone lands from another planet and say, I've traveled across the universe and I wanna know what is a solid. You know, usually people say, oh, a solid is hard, um, but be, because we only have a couple minutes, but I, the, I, a really good way of describing a solid is a solid is something that has a definite shape. So if I take this pen and I put it into a different, I don't have a bunch of containers in here, but if I put this pen into a one gallon container, it still only takes up this, this space. So it has a definite volume as well. It takes up the same amount of space no matter what size of a container it's in. It has a definite shape. The pen is cylindrical. If I put it in a spherical container, the pen would still be cylindrical. If I put it in a giant cubicle box, it would still be a cylinder. Now, if you think about a liquid, and again, I'm not gonna pour this in here, does a liquid have a definite volume? If I take, let's say that this is a, a pint of water. If I poured this pint of water into a one gallon container, would it take up a pint or would it take up a gallon? A pint. It would take up a pint. It has the same volume no matter what size of the container it's in. Now, this is in a cylindrical container. If I poured the water into a cubic container, what shape would it be? It would be a cube, right? If you pour a liquid into a different, the liquid takes on the shape of its container. So a, a solid has a definite shape and a definite volume. A liquid has a definite volume but an indefinite shape, liquid changes its shape. It'll be whatever the shape of the container. A gas, um, and again, it's harder to demonstrate because you can't usually see a gas, but if you think of something that stinks, let's say I open a little container of skunk juice, uh, you wouldn't smell it because it's not gonna go through the computer. But if we were in a classroom, but you'd smell it in the back of the room. So you, you know from experience, a gas is the shape of the container and a gas fills the container. Right, so a gas has no definite shape and no definite volume. And so let's look at this theory. Yeah, go ahead, Henry. I, I have one question and I, I know this is gonna sound silly, but it drives me crazy when people oh. try and ask this riddle. Is water wet or does it make you wet? <laughs> you know, I think it's, I, 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 I would say water is wet. I, I agree, thank you. Um, but you know, wet is by definition what water is, right? I mean, if you get if you get wet by gasoline, it's technically not, you know. But yeah, it, it that, that's that's that, that's a good question. I guess it messes with me. Yeah. All right. So let me just do this because we're almost out of time. So let but let's look at the particulate nature and see if we can use the particles to explain what's going on using kinetic theory. This is an example of using a scientific theory to explain stuff that you can observe, right? The job of the scientist is to explain what's going on, all right? So if you look at um, a solid, in a solid, and also uh, uh, solids are hard, you can't really squish them. Liquids are a little bit compressible. Gases you can squeeze, you know, you, know, you can use a hand pump, right? Um, solids, the particles are very, very close together. That means that they can't move past each other. There are, if you imagine, Things really squish, I mean, this picture does it kind of well. So that, and that we talked about the shape and the volume. In order to change shape, particles have got to be able to move past each other. So if I was to pour a liquid, the, a water droplet on the top has to move past other water droplets to get to the bottom. To change shape, they have to be able to move past each other. In a solid, they're held really tightly. They can't move past each other and there's no space in between them they pretty much only have vibrational motion, all right? In a liquid, and they interact, they stick to each other very strongly. Again, I, well, I'm kind of out of time. So this is what, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna make you guys late for your next class. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start here next time. So I, I don't wanna, I don't like to go over. I don't think it's right. So uh, I'll start here next time, we'll pick up here. All right, so I'm gonna turn off the record. If people have questions and wanna ask questions, um, you know, after class, I'll hang around for a little while.
Otherwise, I will see you 